that you would calm my spirit and help me speak clearly this morning. Thank you, Lord, for all you're going to do in this service this morning. In Christ's in Christ name I pray. Amen. Okay, let's look at hope this morning, okay? First of all, there's, there's something we need to understand about hope. There's all kinds of hope out there. But this hope that he's talking about, this living hope, it's a God-given hope. It's a God-given hope. Not given by the world, it's a God-given hope. Verse 3 says, praise uh, be to God, the, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his great mercy. In whose great mercy? God the Father. God the Father's great mercy. He has given us, the ones that accept Christ, a new birth into a living hope through, because of, been paid for by the resurrection of of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now that last part we're going to get to in a minute. So, so allow me to go back to what it is, okay? Who gave it? Help me. Who gave it? Who gave it? Somebody say God. Okay, I'm going to help you with me this morning. Sometimes it takes me a little while to get you guys uh, locked in. I want you to lock into this this morning, okay? So he has given us Romans 6, 23. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Listen, God gave us the gift, but we have to choose to accept it. It is there for us. And not only that, we have to believe in the power of God to make a difference in our lives, not just any day, but every day. How many of you know that sometimes a phone call comes, sometimes a text message comes, sometimes something bad just, boom, happens all the time? Listen, we got to be ready in season and out of season, no matter what, to be able to rely and depend on the living hope that God has given us. I mean, that's why it's important to understand that real hope comes from God himself. I mean, too often we place our hope in dead things. Let's look at it. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more, then, will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God. That's what God. That's what Jesus did for us. Came to earth, lived a sinless life, offered himself up. Garden of Gethsemane. You know, if this cup can pass for me, please let it pass. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Right? That's what God did for us. Now, and, and he did this to cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Listen, a whole lot of the problems that we face are because of the choices that we make. Life is all about choices, right? Right? And so, you know, we, we um, people have hope in themselves, their education, their money. People have hope in their friends. Um, uh, people have hope in their jobs. People have hope in their money. People have hope in their doctors. But all of these types of hope, no matter how good they are, the money will run out, the friends will run out, the, the whatever, it'll all run out. The doctors will eventually not be able to. All of those things that we put our faith, hope, and trust in will lead to death. Anybody agree? The hope of the Christian, the hope of you who know Christ as your Savior is rooted in Jesus Christ. And that can never fail, and it can never run out. Are you glad of that? Listen, I stand in this pulpit way too many times every year with a casket sitting right here of some loved one that's going on to heaven, right? Now, aren't you glad that the living hope from Christ doesn't finish when the casket leaves the building? Because when you, when you leave this place, those of you that know Christ as your Savior, now listen, I'm just going to tell you, you're not going to go to heaven because you're a good person. You're not going to go to heaven because your grandma got saved. You're going to go to heaven because there was a point in your life that you received the, 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 the living hope of Christ through his blood. You, you admit you're a sinner, believe that Christ raised from the dead and, and, you know, and, and, uh, confess, and, and uh, accept Christ as your Savior, right? A, B, C, admit, believe, confess. <laughs> I know those. I teach them all the time. And so, you guys, you make me nervous. Y'all make me nervous. <laughs> but did you know, can I just tell you something? Did you know that God will, no matter what situation that you're in right now, God will never love you more than he does right now. And. Listen, I love, the, I love the last half of that sentence more than the first, don't you? I mean, because no matter how messed up we get, God still has, gives us this hope.
because of his great love for us. It doesn't depend how right you are or how wrong you are. The living hope that you received when you got saved and God dumped the entire load of the Holy Spirit into you will never leave you, never forsake you, always stand with you, always be closer than, uh, sticks with you close, closer than a brother. Listen, there's no longer a need to be a slave because you are a child of God, right? Yeah. I mean, the difference that we see in, in God's love is how much we choose to believe in it. I mean, the same God that parted the Red Sea, the same God that allowed Peter to walk on the water, is the same God that is willing and able to do miracles in your life. I mean, Jesus said in Matthew 17, 20, he says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say this mountain, move from here to there and it'll move. Nothing will be impossible for you. I always looked at that verse and went, God, I, I wonder what it'd take for me to be able to say, mountain, move. But where, here's where my mind was finite, maybe yours is. I, I, when I lived in Wooster, um, there was a, 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 a hill, pretty good sized hill, a plateau, kind of close to our house. I could see it from my house. And I'd wonder, God, mm, move that mountain, mm, move that mountain. That's not what he's talking about here, guys. It's not what he, how many of you have had a mountain in front of you that you had no way to move and you watched God move it. That, that's what he's talking about. It's not dirt and rocks. It's principalities and powers that you have control over because of the God-giving, God-given, living hope that is in you. Is it good? I mean, in our first birth, we were born sinners. In our first birth, we grew up to be rebels. In our first birth, we couldn't please God no matter how hard we tried. But the cool thing is, when, when, uh, because of our new birth, we were born again to be children of God. Because of our new birth, we received a new nature of servant, no longer a slave to fear. Uh, because of our new birth, now we can please God because we're not working with our righteousness but with God's righteousness. I don't know if you get that, but I'm going to tell you this. Here's the simple easy to understand illustration when you confessed your sins, surrendered your life to God asked him to come in and be your savior he placed in you a living hope I don't feel it, I don't care it's a promise from God you don't have to feel it, to ta you don't have to feel it to take advantage of it, I'm going to tell you what there's a lot of times I don't feel it, how about y'all man I got the flu, I need to go back to work, I don't feel it, God help me Listen, I don't have any money. Man, I'm about to go bankrupt. I don't know what's going to happen. What am I going to do, God? I don't feel like praising, but I'm going to praise anyway because I know that God told me I'll never leave you or forsake you. Because he told me nothing will be impossible for you. Listen, the, 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 this, this passage says God, he has given us new birth, that's salvation, into a living hope that's the holy spirit living in us making sure guiding and protecting you know times we don't even know what to pray for so he knows the words to say to the father for us that's a living hope through the resurrection through the resurrection of christ from the dead now listen you'll have to listen this closer you'll you'll think that i'm preaching heresy here um, if jesus had only died on the cross we couldn't have been saved Bloodshed. There's a lot of people shed blood on the cross. I mean, the Romans were good at that. A lot of people got on the cross. A lot of people shed blood on the cross. A lot of people died agonizing death on the cross, but not one of them had the key to death and to hell. And not one of them had a living hope that had power to raise from the dead. Not one had the ability to have to have direct communication with God and to, to do the things that God wanted him to do. Not one, only Jesus. So what, what made Jesus powerful and why Jesus was able to give us a living hope was not just because he died, but whenever he rose from the dead, that blood that he shed was proven to be effective for us. Does anybody agree? Does that make sense? So, so, so his resurrection proved that his sacrifice on the cross was accepted by God. His resurrection proved that our sins really are forgiven because that's what God said. His resurrection proved that he's able to give us life because he had the keys to death and to hell. And that's the picture of what we show in baptism. 
His resurrection proved that we too are raised from the death of sin into the glory of a new life. And his re resurrection proved that when that casket leaves, it's only the shell of the body because the spirit has already went on to a place that God has prepared just for that person who has went from us straight to heaven. Because of a living So the question is not, do we have it? The question is, do we believe it? And are we going to use it? Guys, if your toes were going to be stepped on, that's probably the time. Let me ask you a question. How many, of you believe, how many of you believe God's real? At least I didn't trip over the steps, amen? How many of you believe that the Bible is true? <laughs> How many of you know that the Bible makes promises? A little fewer, but most of you. Then why do we live as slaves? I'm going to tell you, God has given us a living hope, and it is a God-given hope. Hope, aren't you glad? Now watch this. I'm going to show you something about this living hope. It is an incorruptible hope. How many of you have had, have had good friends that you did something wrong, or maybe you didn't do something wrong, and your friends were nowhere to be found? Right? How many of you have run out of money? How many of you, as smart as you are, have had times where you had no clue what to do? Let me tell you what, your hope was corrupted, was it not? Don't you, don't you hate it when I ask these questions? Because you, you, just, have, you just have to say yes, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's true. But look at this. In his great mercy, God loved us so much he had mercy on us. He gave us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead and, love this and, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Why, why can't it perish, spoil, or fade? Because it's kept in heaven for us. God, God's kept it in heaven for us. He's got your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, and he's given you a hope that is incorruptible. <clears throat> now, I've talked to people a bunch of times, and, and several times lately, to people who are Christians, and yet live so badly that they think they have lost their salvation. I talked to a guy this week who would say, God couldn't love me. <clears throat> God's incapable of loving me. I said, what? What are you talking about? Couldn't love me. How many of you think you're bad enough that God stopped loving you? Let me tell you this. When you say that, you're putting corruptible into the incorruptible. Does anybody agree? Because the love of God is in corruptible. And can I tell you something else? The sin that you think is so bad, God knew about it before you did it. Whoa. So, but let's do a story. So little Jimmy here, if your name is Jimmy, if you know somebody by the name of Jimmy, I'm not talking about him. Little Jimmy got saved. He was a teenager and he walked the aisle and committed his life to Christ and he went on. Five years later, Jimmy did something really awful. I don't know, he robbed a bank, he shot somebody, he did this, he did that. I don't know. Is Jimmy still saved? Jimmy did something real bad. Jimmy was a child preacher. Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy did something awful. Does God still love him? Is he still Christian? Why? Because Jimmy's salvation is incorruptible. Why is it? Because it's kept in heaven. Now, am I saying there's no penalty? Yes, there's penalty for sin, guys. Whether you're a Christian or whether you're not a Christian, I'm going to tell you this. There's penalty for the sins you, that you commit, too. There's penalties for them. I mean, how many of you got spanked by God? How many of you been slapped back the head by God? I got bruises back there. That's why my head's so big, because I get hit all the time. I mean, God, God nails us for sin, but God still loves us. Why? Because his love in, and the living hope that we have is incorruptible. 
is. It just is. Because it's kept in heaven. Now, there's a great passage concerning that, James chapter 4. I love the book of James. It says, um, chapter 4, verse 1, What causes fights and quarrels among you? And, you know, I always look at that verse, and I think about fights and quarrels between us. But can I, can I tell you that that verse, if it doesn't mean it, it could mean fights and quarrels between you and God? Have you ever thought about that? Don't, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Doesn't that sound like a fight between you and God? I mean, you want something, but you don't get it. Doesn't that sound like something between you and God? <laughs> you kill and covet, but you can't have what you, you, you want. You, you quarrel and fight, yet you don't have because you don't ask God. Doesn't that sound like an argument between you and God? <laughs> I'm not saying that's what it is. Maybe you're, you're smart on Scripture now, probably, but, but when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend that you get on your place. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world, that's dead hope, is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world, that's dead hope, uh, becomes an enemy of God. Submit yourselves then to God, that's living hope. Resist the devil, that's living hope. And he'll flee from you, that's living hope. Come near to God, that's living hope. He'll come near to you, that's super living hope. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify you double mind. What's double minded? Uh, really and truly, it just it, it, it translates very close to hypocrite. Okay, what's a hypocrite? It's one, it's somebody that says one thing and, and then acts another way. Sometimes that's us because we depend on dead hope instead of committing ourselves to living hope. L listen, most of the time, uh, living hope will do two things for you. One, it will give you peace at peace of mind immediately, and it'll give you a resolution eventually. Worldly hope may give you a false sense of security now, but isn't able to stand through the long run. Sometimes it will. Sometimes it will. But I'm going to tell you what, dead hope always, always leads to death. Living hope always leads to life. You ever had somebody you prayed for, prayed for, prayed for, and they still died? Still have a living hope. Uh, Andy Brown tells this story. I mean, he, was in, he was in Camden. He prayed, prayed, prayed. He had some financial problems. Prayed, prayed, prayed. God, help me through this. Help me through this. Help me through this. You know what happened? He filed bankruptcy. But you know what he did? He continued to love God, to depend on God. And you know what? God put him all, took him all the way through. Didn't look like what he wanted it to look like. Didn't look like what he thought it might look like. But when he come through that, he was a stronger person, better with his finances, because God didn't just bail him out. He, he taught him through the process, and it was a living hope. And he'll tell you right now, one of the best things that ever happened to him and his financial stability, where he is, is to go through bankruptcy. So sometimes God knows, well, actually, every time God knows better than us. Amen? But when we, lose, when we, when we choose to, to completely sell out to God, not trust the, the dead hope, but, live in the, uh, but to trust the living hope, things like what happened in Daniel chapter 3 will happen in your life. Daniel chapter 3 verse 15 you got these three teenage boys and they're on the, the plains of Dura and they made this big statue and whenever they would hear these all these instruments they were supposed to bow down to to this graven image and so all the people did that's kind of like us you know we kind of do what the, the the world wants us to do sorry guys but these three teenagers said I'm not gonna do that they so they stood when everybody else bowed down so they brought them before Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar said I'm gonna give you one more chance <laughs> So chapter 3, verse 13, uh, Neb, Neb says, when, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, harp, uh, uh, pipes, and all kind of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, the king made, very good. But if you don't worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Can I tell you what, Christians, sometimes when you stand for Christ, you're going to be thrown into a blazing furnace. Um, I wish I had time to go into that more, but I don't. Uh, then it says, what God? What God? Where's your hope? So it says, really, it just says that pretty much. What God will be able to rescue from my hand? So first of all, Nebuchadnezzar's thinking that he's stronger than God, right? So that's what he's thinking. And then he's saying, what God's going to be bigger than me? Well, can I just tell you? Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king. We're going to show you just how much power you do have. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. We don't need to defend yourself. Why? Why do they not have to defend themselves? Who else is there? There's just three of us. Everybody else is bowed down. So who's going to take care of me? Who's going to stand up for me? There's nobody there. There is. 
And you know the rest of the story, but these three kids didn't. They just had a living hope that God was going to do something, right? Yeah. And so we don't need to defend ourselves this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing, if it gets that far and we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve, you know what the cool thing in that verse is when it says uh, what, what God will be able to defend you or, or come to your aid, little G, little G, little God. But look at this big G, big God. The God we serve is able to save us from it. He can do it if he wants to. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. He'll rescue us. Don't know how. Talked about Abraham last week. Put him on the altar. I don't know how this is going to end up, but even if I kill him, God will bring him back to life. I don't know why, because God said that he's going to be the seed to many nations. Huh? But even, verse 18, but even if he does not, we want you to know, oh, king, by the way, little K, not big K, that we'll not serve your gods, little G, or worship the image of gold that you have set up. The doctors will take care of you. Well, if they do, they'll do so because God's given them information, knowledge, and wisdom. I, I, somebody was telling me just the other day they went in for surgery, or some loved one did, and they were going to ask the doctor if they could pray for him. But just before they were about to ask the doctor, the doctor said, would it be okay if I prayed? Whew, that's the surgeon I want. Hmm. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust But wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All is sinking sand. All other ground. What does sinking sand lead to? Death. What does the rock stand for? Life. If we only knew how much power that we are wasting trying to do it our way, we would just be embarrassed <laughs> because of our lack of faith. If we could only grasp this morning, and guys, I've got an advantage over y'all because I see it all the time. I, I, I do. I see it all the time. Got a little couple with me this morning here. Son's gone through some bumps. But you know what? God's been faithful. We prayed for that young man, and that, and that young man, God is healing that young man. He's doing some great work in his life because... God is good. And when we pray, he does something awesome. Amen. Right? Got a little couple normally sits over here. They're out today having some tough problems. Had to get a lawyer involved and some stuff with their kids and all that. But you know what? We've been praying and I've been watching God do some cool stuff in that life. And boy, it's going to be good. I can't wait. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I can't wait. I just look all over this building and I say, you know, I got love. If you could just walk around me for a week, you would see God do so many cool things that you'd have to be crazy not to believe that God can do anything. Hmm. If you want to experience the true um, hope of God, you need to understand it's a God given hope, it's an incorruptible hope, and then thirdly and finally, it is a steadfast hope. Hope. Now, what does something mean to be steadfast? Immovable, solid. Years ago, I took my, my youth group over to Lake Atalanta, and as you go around the trail there, I don't know if it's still there, but there was this wall, rock wall there. They had some sawdust on the bottom, and on the top they would repel, and in case you fell, you'd hit the sawdust. <clears throat> That doesn't sound like a very steadfast thing, but I, I took my kids up there and let them do it. <laughs> Amen. So we'll go up to the top, and they took they have this fancy rope, and they put it around this big tree, right? The rope goes over the side of the hill. You go back, you put it through this carabiner thing, and you lean back. How many of you think that's a good idea? But you know what? I, I, got, I, I didn't get to the edge, but I got about this far from the edge, right? And I, and I, and I leaned back. 
know what the rope held. It, it didn't break, believe it or not. And then I went to the edge. And you know what? There's a different faith involved when you go to the edge. <laughs> I had no problem leaning back on that rope knowing that I was going to fall this far to the ground. But when I get to here, and I know that all there is between me and the ground is some sawdust, I've got a problem with that. You know, I think sometimes God allows us to go through some small things that we think are large to prepare us for the large things that are large. Look at verse 6, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. In this, in this, and the key in this verse is this, so we're going to talk about this in just a second. In this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Ooh, that's a full verse, isn't it? I mean, too many people base their whole lives on the false doctrine that says that life ought to be easy. Name it and claim it. Send $13.86 to the TV and you will live a life of riches. The address to send that money to is 811 South Chateau Village, Rogers, Arkansas, 72758. Just make it out to Pastor Johnny Hart. <laughs> Amen. Name it and claim it. Right? Can I just tell you? <laughs> can I just tell you a secret? Christians have struggles. Not one person said amen. You ever had a struggle? Huh? Christians Christians have financial collapse. Christians have trouble um, with their families. Christians have kids that get into trouble. Christians face health problems. Christians face death. There are no exemptions to trials. Because you're a Christian. Life's not easy. Doesn't that make sense, though, that we need somebody to prop us up when we go through those troubles that we know we're going to have? I asked you a stupid question again. How many of you want to go through how many of you guys want to go through that trouble by yourself? No. Long, long, long time ago, Greenbrier High School. I was, I was fairly big, like, like I am now, weighed a lot less. But uh, there was a couple of guys that, that for some reason didn't like me. I can't imagine why. Um, <laughs> and um, there was a guy named Lynn Hill. Lynn Hill was this big. And Lynn Hill, he could kick like a mule. I mean, he, he could, listen. But there was a cut. This Lynn liked me. <laughs> this big, like me, going down the hallway. Got through something, hit me in the back of the head. He didn't like me. Lynn saw it, and I don't, I don't advocate this. He hit that guy so hard that he fell and slid underneath the lockers. Don't advocate that. Felt pretty good at the time. <laughs> because that guy made friends with me not long after that. I wonder why. You know what I'm saying? Listen, guys, we serve a big old God. And I rejoice in Lynn Hill. Hadn't seen him in 100 years. Great guy. But, Pastor, are you telling me that I need to rejoice when bad things happen? No. <laughs> I'm not telling you. I just lost my job. Listen, people get laid off and have this week. Yay, I got laid off. No. Pastor, I'm going through a divorce. Some are within our circle. Yay! No. I'm financially in ruin. In ruin. Let's go have a party. No. It's not that you're rejoicing because the trial came. You're rejoicing because you do not have to go through it alone. And you have Lynn, I mean, you have God on your side. And He will make a way. I'll tell you a story. I, I, I have, I've told this story before here, but I'll, I'll tell it real quickly. Years ago, Cheryl and I, when we were at Friendship Church, we, we faithfully did our taxes and turned them in, and, and, and our, our tax returner forgot to, uh, where's Mike Middlecamp? Uh, forgot to turn in a sheet, Mike. And we got audited. It was a guy who looked just like you, actually. <laughs> no, no. We got the letter. Cheryl went. Our tax guy went with her, and the guy said, you're in trouble, and uh, come back a certain date. 
Sherlin tax returner left. Tax returner said, you're in trouble. This is going to cost you a lot of money. So what we do? We started asking all our friends for money. We started asking all our friends for advice. We started, uh, you know, uh, reading books. No, we began to pray. I, I was teaching a Sunday school class there at, at Friendship, and uh, that one morning, I said, guys, I need y'all to pray for me. I said, this could be devastating. I, I don't have a lot of money. I don't have any money, and they're going to eat me up, and I'm scared to death. And, and my class prayed for me. And uh, so the very next week, I phone call from a guy that was in that class that I barely knew, didn't know his name. And uh, he said, Johnny says, uh, <laughs> he says, I am a, uh, I'm an accountant, I'm a CPA, and uh, I'm a tax lawyer. This church wasn't that big. There might have been 30 people in my class. One of them was a, an accountant, a CPA, and a tax lawyer. Praise God. Because God will never leave you or forsake you. And because we prayed, God, who's bigger than this, stepped in and said, I'll make a way when there is no way. I'll make a way that will, that will, that will, that will seem so impossible that you could only give the glory to me. <laughs> so it's funny. So, so this guy's name is Frank. Frank said, well, here's what I need. He gave me this long laundry list of things. And sure, I stayed up literally, literally all night long. We started at like 6 o'clock. We worked till the next morning at about 7.15. He showed up in our driveway at 7. We were just printing out the last things. He took all of it, went to the law, law library, was there about an hour, went to the IRS, was there about an hour, and called me up and said, Johnny says, how does a check for $258 sound? I said, sounds pretty good. When can I, when can I write it? And that is a living hope. Story after story after story we could tell. Now, do you think that I might have been rejoicing at that point? I mean, $258 is a lot of money, but it's a whole lot better than $10,000, wouldn't you agree? Now, you look at this verse, and you watch it come alive when you think of it in, that, in those terms. Verse 7, uh, 1 Peter 4, uh, 1, 7 says, These, and it's talking about your trials, have come so that your faith, which is worth greater than gold, Listen, you can't buy your way out of death. You can't buy your way into a happy life. You can't buy your kids out of making bad choices. You have to have something that is worth more than gold. I mean, some of you that have money are put in a bad predicament because you trust your money, because your faith, but your faith ought to be worth more than all your money, right? Um, so that your faith may be proved genuine. When you're going to go through the fire, the thing that you put your faith in better be genuine it better be tested, and it better be proven. Okay, we're almost done. And if you choose to believe him in the small things, and there'll be small things to believe him in, you'll be ready to trust him in the big things. So you better be prepared to trust a hope, and, and if it's a dead hope, you're in a mess. If it's a living hope, watch God kick into action, okay? So, last thing. In God's great for knowledge and his great love for us he prepares us for things that are to come Paul said in Romans chapter 8 verse 38 he said I am in the King in the New King James it says I am persuaded new uh, NIV says I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor what does it say things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of Christ, which is in Jesus, uh, Christ Jesus our Lord. That, my friends, is a living hope. So here's the deal. I told you at the very beginning of the sermon that my job this morning is to convince you to stop trusting in a dead hope and start trusting in a living hope. God knows that you're going to face hardship, sickness, disappointment, problems. But when you're going through those, instead of being in despair, here's what you got to say. God, thank you that I'm not going to have to go through that alone. God, thank you that the, that the result of that, of this, is not going to lead to death, but it's going to lead to life. Even if, even if the result's going to be physical death, it still leads to life because God has prepared a place for you in heaven. Still life, right? In fact, better life. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you don't see him now, 
Watch this. You believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you're receiving the goal of your faith. Amen. So if you're in a problem right now, find your way to the altar and let somebody pray with you. If you're not having a problem right now, ask God to help you to stop depending on the dead things and only depend on the living things. That's God and His Word. That's God and His Holy Spirit living in you. That's listening to the still, small voice of God. That's when you're going through a bad time to say, Oh my goodness, I sure am glad I'm not going through this alone. That's the rejoice that He's talking about. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, I'll be glad to help you through that right here. Admit, believe, confess. Amen. A living hope. Where is your hope? Let's stand. Father, I give you praise. I give this time to you right now. Through your Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray. Uh, that we would get out of the way completely and let your Holy Spirit work in our lives. Lord, I even pray right now as people make their way down this aisle that, Lord, you would help them understand the difference, see the difference, cling to the difference between a dead hope and a living hope. I pray that right now, Lord, we give you this time in the name of Jesus. Amen. You don't wait, don't hesitate. As the praise team begins to sing, you make your way to the altar right now.